بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله in our lessons on the طريق المحمدية the path of our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we've reached the section on the taqwa of the legs and this highlights this important concept that every part of our body has a duty to God, right? that we have been called upon to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely. Therefore, there is an obedience to Allah with every part of us that we use, and there's a gratitude to Allah with every part of the body. The Prophet ﷺ said, every day that that begins every part of the human body has a charity due upon it. That what is a charity? It is an expression of gratitude, which is that you use it as Allah commanded it, and you not use it as Allah prohibit, prohibited. And you can say that baseline gratitude is, baseline gratitude is to have taqwa, right? which is why Imam Junaid al-Baghdadi, when he was asked about what is taq, what is gratitude, mashukr, one of the definitions he gave is a taqwa and la ta'asi Allah bima an'ama alayk. Taqwa is that you do not disobey Allah with what he blessed you with. Taqwa is that you, you do not disobey Allah with what he blessed you with. Right? Sorry, gratitude. A shukr, gratitude is that you not disobey Allah with what he blessed you with. What is, what is not disobeying Allah? What is the capacity of not disobeying Allah? What is it called? It's called taqwa. So gratitude, the practical expression of gratitude is taqwa. That you do not disobey Allah with what He blessed you with. What He has He blessed you with? Each of these fundamental faculties. Right? Each of these fundamental faculties. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we be of those who uphold this in the best of ways. Bidnahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So we're going to look today, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, at the taqwa of legs. And there, there is a fundamental concept here that we look when we begin by looking at the key principles of taqwa. The key principles of taqwa, which is that we, you know, key principles of the taqwa of legs is that we saw when we looked at the sins of desires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina, do, do not draw even near fornication. Right? Verily it is ever a shameful outrage and an appalling way. Right? From Surah Al-Isra verse 32. Meanings are understood from texts broadly in two ways. By the expression of the text but also by the indication of the text. Also by the indication of the text. So the expression of the text here is do not, do not draw close to, i.e. do not walk to zina. But what is zina? It is a sin. Zina is a sin. It is a grave sin. But also from that, we understand that do not walk, do not draw close to any sin. Why? Because zina is prohibited because Allah has prohibited it. So anything else that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, the same principle would apply. The very same principle would apply. Do not draw close to it. Right? Do not draw close to it. Uh, so 
So therefore, so therefore, right, you know, this is a general principle that what we consider, right, do not draw close to, and the drawing close to is either do not take the means of getting there, but literally do not walk to it. And do not walk to it. There's do not take the means that lead you to sin, but also literally do not walk to zina, do not walk to, to sin. Right? Do not walk to sin. This is understood, the ulama tell us, by what is called the indication, you know, the clear indication of the text. Okay, now if we take that as a given, then the ulama tell us an important distinction between two types of places. There are two different types of places. One is you have a place of sin and a place with sin there. Right? You have a place with sin there. What is the difference between a nightclub and a shopping mall? Does sin take place in a, in a shopping mall? Yes. Okay. But it's not the primary activity, right? Sin does take place there, but it is not the primary activity. So this, the distinction the ulama make between these two categories is as follows. That a place of sin, مَكَانُ مَعْصِيَةٍ is a place where the primary activity is impermissible. So for example, if, you know, that's like, like a nightclub, a bar. What's the primary thing that this place is for? It's not allowed. Now, what if there is a, is one of these places, but you really like the patatas bravas there. With these really nice Spanish potatoes with this uh, kind of, Tangy sauce. That, 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 that does not allow you to go there. That does not allow you to go there. So a place whose primary activity is impermissible, even if you have a permissible need, you are not allowed to go there. It is haram to go to a place of sin where the primary activity is directly sinful. You cannot go there. Even if Unless, of course, it is out of necessity that cannot otherwise be fulfilled. You're choking or, you know, and you need a cup of water. Now, if you can still avoid it and, you know, just take a few deep breaths and go to the, you know, go to the gas station or whatever, that is certainly better. But it does not render it impermissible. As opposed to as opposed to the second category of place, and th these are the places that we very often are not careful about, which is a place with sin. A place with sin. Makanun and fihi masia. A place where the primary activity may be sinful, but there is a secondary presence of sin. Sadly, the, the human being is created weak and whether disbelievers or believers and we incline towards all kinds of wayward ways. That's just the nature of the human being. So few public places are free of sin. Few public gatherings are free of sin. But then if you look at the Quran and the Sunnah, they encourage us to be together, but they also caution us there's no good in most of their intimate gatherings. Why? Because people engage in sinful things. What do, when people gather, family, friends, what do, they, what do they frequently engage in that is sinful? Gossip, backbiting, tail-bearing, slander. So... These require caution and principle. These require caution and principle. The sin 
the sins that are intangible are often more dangerous than the sins that are tangible. Because the t sins that are intangible, the, uh, that are tangible, are obvious. But what is more grave for you to eat a ham sandwich or for you to slander another person? Either directly slandering them or being party to their slander. Someone is being slandered and you listen to it, but do not object. Slander is far worse. Slander is far worse. Imam Abdul Hayy al Laknawi relates that the majority of scholars state that hurtful backbiting, that backbiting is worse than deliberately missing an obligatory prayer. Why? Because if you deliberately missed an obligatory prayer, it's a grave sin. The Prophet said, it's as if you've lost your family and all that you own. It's as if you lost your family and your property. That's how serious deliberately missing a prayer is. But, because this relates to the rights of others. But also, do not deem, do not deem a, a sin as small, rather consider how great is the one you've disobeyed. Right? So, so the secondary presence of sin requires navigating with taqwa. Particularly if the sin is if the place is avoidable and or the sin it, you fear to be affected by it right? so the ruling is it's disliked to go to such places if avoidable and if one engages in them one minimizes one's presence there for example this is why the prophet sallallahu told us what are the most beloved of places to earth, to allah and what are the most odious places to allah what are the most beloved places to allah the mosque, or the most odious places to Allah, the marketplace. Now the marketplace is in one sense a blessed place. This is where you go earn a living, this is where you go buy your, you know, your, your provisions for your household, etc. But some of the greatest and most harmful, lying, cheating, deception, wrongdoing, oppression, and sin take place in the in the marketplace. So this requires, this doesn't mean you leave it, but where you do need to engage it, but you reduce your engagement in it. Those are not places that a believer hangs out. What are you doing this weekend? I'm hanging out at the mall. But also this should condition our choices of where you go. That if you have a choice, you, you, know, you want to take the family out, you could go to Uncle Tayyib's grill, nice place, but they don't blast music, they don't have, you know, haram posters on the wall, etc. Versus crazy fitna, yet certified halal place. Now the food's allowed, the primary activity at a restaurant is food, but, right, because you are, what are the harms of going to such a place? What are the harms of going to such a place? Yeah, so, but the most, one of the things that this, these, you know, what is a sinful activity? This is something that is hated by Allah. It is contrary to the command of Allah. Gratitude to Allah, taqwa to Allah entails that we love for the sake of Allah, we hate for the sake of Allah. So this is something we, we should be hating. So how can you hate something and be, be sitting right next to, you know, that the Prophet, uh, you know, that the Prophet ﷺ said that alcohol is, is ummul khaba'ith, the most vile of matters. So you go, you have halal steak at a steakhouse where you're sitting next to a display of alcohol, these, these, these are odious to Allah and His Messenger. These are source of, and why? Because they're source of destruction and harm for humanity. So what has to have, you know, taqwa entails ittiqa, shielding oneself from such things. 
and then but making considered choices. Sometimes, in some contexts, it may be difficult to avoid certain things, and one navigates. We'll look later at the fiqh of restaurants and so on. We talked a little bit about earlier. So, to the extent it's avoidable, one avoids it. If one can't avoid it, then one makes choices on the basis of what is more wholesome. What, what is more wholesome? How? Where you go shopping. Some, some shops are far more wholesome than others. But then if you start thinking about it, why are you shopping at some major mega corporation that vis-a-vis -vis, what about the right of the neighbor the local shop down the road okay you maybe pay a little more helping someone who's earning a lawful living is better than giving charity it's better than giving in charity and very often people just you know there's great merit but you're so supporting a local you're supporting a fellow muslim business what are why are we buying Halal meat from major supermarkets. When there are so many halal meat stores that are owned within our community, that are striving to run in, in, in good ways. But also when you have a choice of two places, we choose the more wholesome. Regarding speech, that when they hear speech, they follow the best of it. Likewise, when we have choices, we strive to, we do our best to make the better choice. That is deen, that is taqwa. But when we do need to engage with it, we engage, we sensibly minimize it. Okay, I need to go to the mall because I need to, you know, re replace my hard drive. And then I need to do this. I need to buy these things, etc. So we choose, okay, how do we engage in this? And also, kids are a bit stressed out. We need to go, yeah, we'll go grab them some things that they like, etc. But if you have a choice of when you go to the mall, the mall is not the same at all different times. If you can go during the day in the week, it's far more wholesome than if you go at peak times, you know, the PFTs, peak fitna times. So you avoid that. You avoid that. We also navigate with purpose. You know, the Prophet ﷺ, when he left home, he lowered his gaze to everything that was not of concern to him while he upheld good character with all that he interacted with. He'd be the one who initiated salams and he'd greet people and this, and these are adab that we should uphold wherever we are. And in these places, it's sunnah to make remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Right? Remembrance of Allah before we enter these places and while we're in these places. But you're, it's prohibited if you have reasonable fear of sin. So why are you going to the mall? For all the bad reasons. In that case, you're not allowed to go. Right? Because the key to leaving sin is to block the way between you and what leads you to the sin. Bad habits are broken by creating a pattern interrupt between what between the what leads you between the trigger of of the bad habit and the bad habit itself. So you want to identify why do I end up going and seeing haram movies? Well, it's when I go to the mall on my own and I'm kind of just like down and dejected and I grab the meal on my own then I feel miserable say oh might as well just go and do that okay it's okay I want to grab a meal but either you go purposely I'm going to go there and get out or I'll go with somebody else and this is why one of the aspects of places like that is it doing things alone is contrary to the sunnah doing things alone it, people would be shocked. The Prophet ﷺ said, if people knew the harm of, of traveling at night, no man would leave home at night 
if they did not need to. And the ulama say that this, this is not referring to initiating a journey. But it's even within the city. That, and this used to be very common, that if people are returning from home, go home together. You're going to work, pick someone up on the way. It's one just at a level of you know, social wellness. Right? Aloneness, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, that you know, being you know, community is mercy. Being with others, and the Prophet ﷺ defined even if it is two people. And aloneness is torment. It's contrary to Sunnah to live alone. It's contrary to Sunnah to eat alone. It's contrary to Sunnah to go out and do. It's miserable because these are inherently we are social and we're social beings. Say Naqib al Attas doesn't like calling the human being an animal. He said because we. Our fundamental reality is not that we are animals ennobled with intellect. We are, we are souls in bodies. Right? But that's, a, but that's a, you know, it's a true point, but it's a minority opinion. Okay, so this is about with respect to places of sin. This also, of course, affects certain types of activities we engage in. You know, we talk about restaurants, similarly, it applies to the issue of um, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. For example, attending events. Attending events. There's some marriages that are just so out there that they are places of sin. <laughs> it starts with sin. In the middle, there's open sin. And the end is you know, a DSM, dramatic sinful moment. Okay. And particularly if you are a person of either religious leadership or someone who's looked up to in religion, these are not places that one should be, or where one needs to be there, one goes in a manner that one is keeps away from the sin, does not validate the sin, and if the sin becomes a primary activity, one must step away. One must step away. Right? Because then it becomes a, you know, if suddenly, you know, lights go out and they're starting, and this, and what is halal and what is haram, it's not, is it bad, it's it's. Haram. If it's uh, it's not that bad, it's, it's okay. No. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ tells us, Al-halalu bayyin. The lawful is evidently clear. Wal-haramu bayyin. And the unlawful is evidently clear. Okay. So there's certain things that are clear-cut, permitted or not permitted. And there one, you know, one needs to be honest with oneself. Seek an answer from your heart. You know that this is not acceptable to Allah. And the heart is a faculty within one that turns towards the, ple the pleasure of Allah. Is this acceptable to Allah? And be honest about it. Of course, the believer who cares, sometimes there's difficult choices. What does one do? One consults before one acts. One consults before one acts. Okay. So, the author then tells us about the... Um, the sins of the feet. So he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Imam al Birgivi, Wahiya the Habu ila majalis il Masia, Imma li fairliha, O lin nothari ilayha. So the sins of the feet are walking to gatherings of sin, either to engage in the sin or to look at what is sinful. And they also add to it in the commentaries or to listen to what is sinful. And also, there's this sort of, you know, heedless Muslim sense, the HMS, right? That, you know, sins are bad things. Other things, what's so bad about it? But if you were to, and as a believer, if something's not clear, we, we find out what, what's the big deal. Now, what destroys societal values, etc., is what you listen to, what you watch. 
someone was trying to make an argument with me, and they themselves realize, <laughs> sometimes you just have to listen and let people come to the conclusion that there's some random Indian movie. First, this, the whole genre is so toxic, where apparently the heroes or whoever the protagonists are, you can't call them heroes, basically are mass murders, but they're doing it for family. Okay. And he sent me the lyrics to this song. He said, but isn't that like really about brotherhood and family? It says, we're going to burn down the whole world. We don't, we're just looking at the chapter of jihad today. That even in jihad, you, you know, you, you don't mutilate others. You don't do this. You don't do that. You don't kill the weak, the innocent, you know, the priests, the monks, this and that. You don't hurt the animals unnecessarily. <laughs> you know, and you're celebrating vice. So these are very significant things. These are very significant things. This is what, you know, these, these are th the things that, you know, because you know, Sheikh Ahmed Talal Al-Ahdab, may Allah protect and preserve, he, he explained that where do, where do actions arise from? The ulama tell us that faith is manifest. In, of course, it's grossly simplified. He gave a talk at, at the wedding of a, the daughter of a dear friend of mine, I recorded it because if Sheikh Tal speaks, it's worth listening to. And I've been doing this ilm thing for a little while, but he requires digestion. I listened to the talk four or five times, four times at least fully, but I've spent years now reflecting on it and, and read around what he said. I asked my wife, she said, I was tired. I came for a celebration. I tuned out. I respect Sheikh Tal, but I tuned out. He's a learned person. But basically, that where do actions arise from? Like where does good conduct arise from? That there's there's what you hold to be true. What you hold to be true, and that's what we call that's our iman. Right? What you hold to be true is how you view the world. What you hold to be true is manifest, if you really hold it to be true, in your values. In your values. And the values are your aspirational values, which what you aspire to. I value kindness. But then if I'm mean to everybody, is that is kindness really my value? Okay. So you, you know, so va the values you have have two aspects, right? The beginning of the values is the aspirational values. Right? Okay, you, you, there are certain things you hold to be true, which is our faith. So you have your aspirational values, but then you have your actualized values. Right? From those actualized values is your character, which is how you are, is your attitude. It's how you are that results in you acting as you do. And that's your character. And from character arises conduct. Is the, the things that you actually do. Okay, so those are there's what you hold to be true. From that you have your values. Then you have your character. And from that arises actions. From these things, what you listen to, what you watch, you even engage in, you know, it hits you at the level of values. It hits you at the level of values. It's not a small, small thing. And and many of the things, like you know, you don't, you know, you don't demolish a building by saying, "Fall," you chisel away at it. Right? Now, you can also just go and you know, do a contained explosion, but buildings also collapse through erosion. And that which erodes your values is a lot more dangerous than the outright sin. So this is why we have to be particularly careful about these. Okay. There, so this is the governing principle. Then there's other issues. One of them is, he says, وَالْخُرُوجُ إِلَى الْجِهَادِ بِغَيْرِ إِذْنِ وَالِدَيْهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ كَافِرَيْنِ إِلَّا أَنْ يَغْلِبَ عَلَى ظَنِّهِ أَنَّهُمَا كَرِهَا 
لمقاتلة أهل دينهما لا للشفقة فيجوز وكذا كل سفر يخاف فيه الهلاك كركوب البحر والمفاوز أو كانا محتاجين محتاجين إلى النفقة أو الخدمة وحكم أحدهما كحكمهما So travel without parental permission right, to jihad and there's hadiths about this right? even if they are disbelievers and this is if they're not if they're you know, unless they're denying permission because you are going to fight their peoples. So someone is um, or if they don't want you to go simply because they care about you. But, and this is the principle, so if they, this is the same principle and he'll explain the principle with respect to every travel from which there's fear of destruction or harm. Such as, in the old days, such as traveling by sea. The old days, especially early in Islam, it was very dangerous to travel the sea. Especially the Indian Ocean was considered very dangerous. And the ulama, some of our Indian ulama can be a bit literalist. Um, so some of the early the literalist Hanafis sometimes, so they... They said, and they said, well, this is what the Hanafi fiqh books say, but the Hanafi fiqh books also say, the witness of someone who travels to India is not accepted. And they said two reasons. One, because from Arabia, if you took the sea route, it's only a fool would risk their life. Right? And number two, only a corrupt person would risk their deen. Said because of how much corruption and because of how beautiful the women, women of India are. So, that's, um, but of course that's not a legal ruling, right? If you can uh, safeguard yourself. So, if there's reasonable fear of harm for you, then it's within the right of your parents to prevent you from going, if there's reasonable fear. But if you're going for something that's personally obligatory, then you could go even without their permission, such as Hajj. Right? Um, or, one of the, so the basis is it's sunnah to seek parental permission even if you're going for other, th you know, for, for just per a permissible trip where they don't fear they'll be happy. But it's from adab to inform them and even if it's token to seek their permission. It's from the adab of travel. But if they withhold their permission, okay, if there's reasonable fear, then that's a reasonable Prohibiting from them. Right? Someone wants to go and work in a war zone. And the parents are not comfortable with that. There's reasonable fear. So there the duty of a dutiful child would be to convince their parents. Or if the, if the parents need you. Right? If they need you. For what? Either to, to provide for them if they're needy. So they need your actual presence or they need you to serve them. But if you there, if you were to take care of provision and service of them, then you could travel. So basically two reasonable grounds for, you know, for having to listen to your parents in terms of uh, travel and so on. One is you have to have a reasonable fear regarding your trip. But if someone says, if some parents say, Beta, I don't want you go to I won't I don't want you to go to New York City because you know it was they think it was the Muslims who did the 9-11 attacks. What if they blame you? Is that a reasonable fear? That if, if a Muslim goes to New York City, they go to Jackson Heights, they'll be captured that we yeah, how old were you when 9-11 happened? Hmm? Okay, you were small, right? So it's not conceivable that people. You know, so that's not a reasonable fear. But if someone, but it's fundamental difference between someone who has a business trip to Cairo versus someone who has a business trip to to a war zone, for example. And this would take us outside the topic, but you can see answers related on seekers related to obedience to parents. 
Um, so this is the issue of parental permission. Then there's an issue that, because, and the reason he mentioned it, the issue of fleeing a plague, because there's many hadiths regarding this. So he says, وَالْفِرَارُ مِنَ الطَّعُونَ وَالدُّخُولُ عَلَيْهِ We have an on-demand course on Seeker's Guidance. We did it during, during the pandemic about the history of plagues in, you know, of the history of plagues through Islamic history. It's very, ins inshallah, we took it from what the ulama mentioned. There's many benefits in it, but also some of the, these discussions. And it's from the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba what to do when, they're, uh, when they are affected by the plagues. Which is why Sayyidina Mu'adh ibn Jabal, who died, who was martyred in the plague in, in his early 30s, him and others, when they saw the first signs of being affected by the plague, they said, welcome to the promise of the Prophet ﷺ. Because he promised great reward to those who would be martyred in the plague. Because that's what a type of martyr. Of course, one does not court such things. So, so fleeing from the plague or entering upon it, both have been, been interdicted. And there's various hadiths amongst them. Akhraj Bukhari and Muslim عن عبد الله بن عن عبد الرحمن بن عوف مرفوعا إذا سمعتم به بأرض فلا تق تقدموا عليه وإذا وقع بأرض وأنتم بها فلا تخرجوا فرارا منه. So Bukhari and Muslim relate that, that the beloved messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, if you hear that there's a land where the plague has spread, don't go to it. Don't go to it. But if you are in a land where the plague falls, then don't travel from it. Don't travel from it. Or don't flee from it. Um, and the in, there's many interpretations of this, but the primary one that the author mentions, that that one of them is that this is in order to guard one's, one's belief that nothing benefits and harms but Allah. Okay, number one. But, okay. So one can go to a land where, where there is a place, where the play, or leave from it in itself as long as you don't operate out of fear. Right? Out of fear. Right? Fear meaning fear. Oh, what's going to happen? Right? Because we don't fear the plague. We don't. You know, we we t we both we trust in Allah, and we take the means. You know, we take the means. But but he says, فَيَرُدُّهُ أَنَّ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ لَمْ يَدْخُلِ الشَّامَ بَعْدَ بَعْدَ الْمَنْشُورَةِ فَرَجَعَ فالصحيح أن النهي على ظاهره. But Imam Al Birgibi says that it's not only to protect beliefs, but rather it's also to take world, worldly precautions. Okay, so it's that if it will spread, if you know, if it'll harm you, if you if you're in a place where there isn't a plague, your health is a blessing. Don't go to a land where there, where the plague is widespread, such that there's fear of you being affected. Without, while having no, you know, we trust in Allah, but we take the means. But also, there's a public consideration. If you're in a place, especially in the old days where they didn't have things like, you know, testing and so on. If you're in a place where the plague has spread and there's fear of contagion, then don't travel to other lands. Because then you could be the agent of spreading the plague. And the, the, the ulama, you know, the notion of quarantine existed in many different societies. But the Europeans took, were influenced amongst others, and some say exclusively by the, the, the Muslim medical tradition, building on the works of the Greeks and the Indians with respect to if someone has a sickness, that they be quarantined until they get better before they mingle with others within society or before they were to travel to contain the plague. But the plague affected Muslims and others. Ibn Hajar actually comments that many people said, we will trust in Allah, we won't be harmed by anything. So they continued to gather. Many just comments, and most of them died. <laughs> right? 
because you trust in Allah, you're rewarded for it, but you take the means. Right? And that's the, the balance of the believer. So, then there are things related to the property of others. So he says, well, meshu. في ملك الغير بلا إذنه دارا أو بستانا أو كرما أو أرضا مزروعة أو مكروبة. So he says that walking in the property of another without their permission is is from the sins of the feet. Whether it is their home or a garden or um, like a vineyard, you know, there's vines and you know. Uh, or farmland وَإِنْ أَرْضًا جُرُزًا بِلَا حائط ولا خندق. Even if it is an open property where there, it, there isn't walls or a trench right? because it, it's hard if you have large farmland to put a wall everywhere there's an honor that don't walk on other people's property right but he says but if it is an open land وَكَانَ الْمُرُورُ لِحَاجَةٍ مِنْ غَيْرِ ضَرَرْ يُرْجَ الْجَوَازْ لِوُجُودِ الْإِذْنِ دِلَالَةً وَعَادَةً but if there is an imp implicit permission right, such that it's an open property and you're just walking through it because there's a need then it is hoped for that there won't be harm in it because normally this is allowed. So unless there's a sign, do not walk through. So you're on one road to get to the next road. You just have to walk on a private property, but there's a path and there's no sign, do not enter, whatever. Then it should be fine. But there you look at what is the custom of the land as well. Some places there, it's much more relaxed than others. So in general, the general principle of of others' is property is that it's inviolable. I can't just take Uncle Sufyan's jacket and wear it outside without his permission. Unless he's either given me permission or the permission is evident. Do you have to ask permission to use someone's uh, tissue paper if you're a guest? No. If they're in the kitchen and you kind of know them, Normally, is it okay to go to the to the washroom without asking? On like on the on the main floor. Yeah, especially if they invited you. Let's say it's a it's it's family or friends, and you know them. Normally, would they be fine with you going to the to the washroom, or do you have to go to the kitchen? And say, can I go to the washroom? If you know them, that you could where you can assume permission, that where you can seek explicit permission is fine. But sometimes. I know if I went to my brother and said, uh, could I use your washroom? He'd be like, you know, if he'd find it very strange. But, you know, understood permission, if it's clear, is also permission. But if the downstairs washroom is empty, can you go upstairs and look around? Is there a washroom upstairs? No. Unless there's that degree of intimacy. Can you go to the master bedroom? Because... I say the master bedroom probably has a washroom and you go in and of course not, right? So this is what you know requires caution. And related to that is don't pry into other people's property as well. They don't go and see, oh, how is their backyard? Do they have a swimming pool? Do they have this? That's not allowed. It's not allowed. One, because we mind our own business. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala tajassasu. don't pry into people's affairs. Um, right. but then he says if you go through someone else's property for example this comes also if people are hiking and so on that this is someone's farm property there's no other way around then he says right. right. So, but you're also allowed, if you're invited, you're allowed to come in, for example, if the door is open, if it's understood that there's permission. So sometimes, for example, in the summers, you know, people will have their gatherings in the backyard. You're invited. 
and everybody's in the back here, do you have to go ring the doorbell or can you just go to the back? Permission's understood. Because you're, you're invited. But if there's a gathering in the back and you know, Uncle Sufyan didn't invite you to the barbecue and you just kind of just show up, that's against the sunnah. Right? You don't just show up uninvited to a gathering. Um, likewise, if he mentions a number of cases, if you, you dropped property on sort of someone else's property, you, you, know, you could go pick it up. But where it's possible to seek permission, one does. I mean, if you're hiking and you dropped something, you can go back to pick up the property. Um, okay. Also, there's a number of issues related to, to, to taqwa. One of them is there's some adab related to graveyards. So he says, Well, meshu al al maqabir, with tiba'un nisa, al janaiz, was yara tuhunna al qubur. Okay. So walking on graves has been prohibited by the Prophet. Hmm? But what does this, and this is, of course, one of the things that you know, we should aspire as a community to do things well. The way, in, certainly in Canada, a lot of graves are set up in the graveyards is contrary to the Sunnah. Why? Because we respect the living, but we also respect the dead. So if you just flatten the grave, what happens? If you go to the graveyard, and it's sunnah to visit the graveyard, um, especially family and others who have rights over you, it's very difficult to avoid walking on graves. You have to like really, and it's hard to figure out. Right? So we should aspire to do things in a manner that Graves are clearly demarcated, etc. And there's many other issues related to, to graves. Also, he relates that for women to following funerals and visiting the graves, but this relates to excessive visiting of graves. Where, for, for excessive visiting of graves, or number two, where it would lead them to be overwhelmed by grief. Or would lead to, if there's a huge, if there's a huge funeral, it would lead to unavoidable mixing and the like. It would be unbecoming. And so th th that's another of the of the aspects, and the um, and then. There are, there's fiqh also related to entering the mosque. It is not permitted for the one requiring ghusl or the one or a woman in a state of menstruation or postnatal bleeding to enter the masjid. And the reason for this is what? Is the Prophet forbade it. So certain rulings are of discernible meaning. Why don't we steal people's property? Because the harm is obvious. Right? This is their right, this, that. But there's other things that they are, what are, they're called devotional rulings. Allah and, and His Messenger have commanded in this way. It's not, because rationally, you know, people don't go around dripping blood all over the place. Not historically and not now. So it's not related to that, because that's something, you know, and you, you know, the fuqaha say, if anyone imagines that, that, you know, that respectable women are walking around with blood dripping down their legs, you know, is ignorant of reality and of self-respect. So, this, you know, there's certain rulings that, and, you know, menstruation, postnatal bleeding are not, we do not believe that these are things that Allah imposed on women because that Adam tempted, that Eve tempted Adam or anything like that, right? We also don't consider interaction with a menstruating woman or, you know, after pregnancy to be taboo, etc. Right? Um, and there's lots of rulings related. This is not the place for these. However, practically, a masjid is only that which is designated as a masjid. So most 
Islamic centers, it's only the men's prayer area that is legally designated as the masjid, practically. Why? One of the proofs is they're set up as multiple purpose facilities, especially the larger centers. You have you know, people, you know, they have basketball courts there, they have washrooms. You cannot relieve yourself in the masjid. Is the washroom part of the masjid? No. You have a school set up there. You know, people are doing all kinds of stuff in the, you know, they're there all day. So only the place designated is the masjid. Now, generally, that would be the the place, which is typically the you know the, the, the men's musalla area. The rest of it is in the broader sense masjid. But it doesn't take the legal designation of masjid with respect to these rulings. Okay. And then he also says from the, you know, the taqwa of legs is وَمَدُّ الرِّجْلِ نَحْوَ الْقِبْلَةِ وَالْمُصْحَفِ وَالْكُتُبِ الشَّرِيفَةِ فِي النَّوْمِ وَالْيَقَضَى Stretching one's feet towards the qibla or towards the Qur'an or respectable books in one's sleep or waking unless they are higher than where one is or far away. Extending one's feet. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hajj twice, Allah. Whoever has deep respect, ta'zeem, for the symbols of Allah, then truly that is from taqwa that is in the heart. So, but this is not prohibited. According to the majority of scholars, this is a matter of dislike and adab. It's not of outright prohibition. But adab is called for. Is it sinful to pick your nose? Like, are you going to be punished in hell for picking your nose? No, but please don't do it, right? It's no, 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 I'm just pointed to the empty. So, right? Just because something is not haram doesn't mean it's fine to do. We don't pick our nose. We don't, all kinds of things. Is it from adab to, to, for me to grab toothpaste and start doing there and to spit into my cup? Of course not, right? So that's also... Uh, lost on many people then. But stretching one's feet towards the Qibla is dis disrespect because this is a respectable direction. Stretching one's feet towards uh, the, the Qur'an is disrespectful according to the vast majority of scholarship because it's the Qur'an is worthy of our respect or you know, religious books or books in general. We do not put books on the ground unless they're piled up. We don't put the Qur'an on the ground. If you want to go and pray or renew your wudu, someone wants to do the prostration of recitation, the thing to do is either is one of the things to do. If you're sitting on the ground praying and you've got a pillar next to you or something, is you put the, the Quran upwards, it's not putting it on the ground. If you put it flat, it's a disrespect. When you put it up for the need, you need to do a prostration of recital, whether at home or in the masjid. That is one of the ways. Right? Like you're you're tired and yeah, you could go put it on the table, but then you might just walk away. So you can put it vertically, that, that's fine. But where you can put it on an elevated place, it's of course much better. But sometimes that's not as easy. Okay. But if it's elevated or, um, or away from you, it's not disrespect. So you have books in your room. What are you going to do? If you don't keep the, the, the books at your feet, immediately at your feet, so you're allowed to go to sleep, right? Or they're on the shelves, then khalas, there's a, there's a barrier. Um, likewise, putting worldly objects on top of religious books is from poor manners. But this is, of course, not look related to the sins of the feet. But for example, this is not a book, but you know, some people, like for example, you know, they put their glasses on the Quran or even putting a tasbih. It's one of the most annoying things. Many religious projects do it, but the ulama say it's not just because the idea of respect that the, 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 the Quran is, is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Some people put these pictures of, you know, someone who's reciting, they put their glasses between them. Okay, it's innocent. 
And we only know once we know, but put your glasses to the side, don't put them there. Don't put your tasbih on it, right? And we shouldn't be spreading images like that, because it's not, it's not, dis, it's not respectful. Um, And from the sins of the, the legs is to hit, is to kick food. Because food is also worthy of respect. Because it is, it's the basic material blessing. If you don't have food, you're going to die. And so the attitude of respect towards food, that if you see food lying on the ground, you pick it up. You put it, particularly bread. Right? Because bread it's, it's, a sta it's one of the historical staple foods by which humanity has survived. And there's many hadiths and narrations about that. But also wasting. We already talked about waste. You can see it in, from previous classes. Don't waste these things. These are fundamental blessings. And we should take ourselves to account about how much we waste. But that's a separate matter. So, f you know, so kicking food. So, you know, you got a delivery of food and you're... You know, and Uncle Sufyan says, Faraz Beta, please, you know, could pass me the food, just kick it towards him. We don't do that. With food, we have an attitude of respect. But also to, to kick an animal, right? To kick an animal, and likewise, any other transgression towards an animal is a sin of the feet. And even, that's why he, then he says this amazing thing. One exerts one's utmost to fulfill the rights of animals. Why? Because the scholars have said that there is punishment with, the, with respect to their rights. Also because on the day of judgment, they say, from this perspective, it is easier to wrong a Muslim than a non-Muslim. Because on the day of judgment, Uncle Sufyan's a righteous man. He's done lots of good deeds. You ate some of his cream puffs. It's okay, beta, I forgive you. Because he has lots of good deeds. But you go on the day of judgment to someone bereft of good deeds. It's just, just from this perspective, it's more dangerous to wrong them. Of course, don't wrong anybody. But, and, but it's conceivable that, that, that non-Muslim became Muslim but wronging an animal, it's not conceivable that the animal will forgive you on the day of judgment. So you'll be taken to task for sure about animals, which is why no society, historically, we've, had, we've adopted a lot of bad habits uh, as an ummah, particularly in the state of post-colonial colonial and post-colonial shock. But... If you see, and a li just one of many living examples, you see this in many parts of the Muslim world, but if you go somewhere like, like Istanbul and you see how the cats and dogs are treated there, it's amazing. That dogs go to sleep on the road and <laughs> cars drive around it. It's amazing. But that's civilization. Um, but hitting an animal right, is, a, is a very grave matter. Even they say that you know, you know, if you want to spur an animal forward with your legs, like a, you know, a horse or a mule or anything that you're riding, whether for racing or travel purposes, you do it to nudge the animal, but you don't do it in a manner that hurts the animal. And we've taken a lot about, about this, but this is another example. And likewise, to destroy property with it. Right? To destroy property with it. We're going to continue next class by looking at walking towards rulers and wrongdoers. It's also very, it's a very serious matter. So we'll look at that and complete the section on the sins of the, you know, the feet. But the, one of the key distinctions is, the, is to, to be clear. Your presence in a place of sin is haram. Right? Even if what you're doing is not sinful. And it'll, it'll, you are party to that sin. Indirectly, but you are a party to it. And you have acqui and you've accepted their sin. Because when there's something wrong, we know whoever of you sees the wrong, let them ch change it with their hand. If you cannot change it with your hand, then with your tongue. Only if you cannot do that, then 
Can you dislike it in your heart? And that's the least of faith. But you had a choice. You don't you didn't have to go there. You didn't have to go there. And the only way change happens, right? The only way change happens if we vote with our feet. In many families, people make adjustments. If you do it with good character, you explain. And one of the practical things to do is to give alternatives. To give alternatives. Um, one, of the, one of the Syrian scholars was saying, I have a concern about Indian and Pakistani weddings. I said, yes. I was thinking that, yeah, we have some pretty uncontrolled weddings. He said, I don't see the fundamental difference between a funeral gathering and a religious wedding from your culture. That is a time for celebration. You need to have halal modes of celebration. If you don't facilitate the halal, you're going to do, the, if you're going to do other things. You don't want to celebrate. The prevalent modes of celebration are unwholesome right and one of the practical ways you know to 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 change things for the good is just facilitate the good because ultimately people most people don't want that song because i love that people just want some they want some celebration so one of the practical ways and in many cultures even irreligious people like in certain parts of you know of syrian society and it's prevalent in Jordan, that even families who are not particularly religious, who do they bring for weddings? They bring nasheed groups. And men dance to nasheed. And women dance amongst the women in dignified ways, both to, to nasheed. People just want to celebrate. This is time to celebrate. Right? But we do it in, a, in manners, in ways that are acceptable and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And that in many cultures you have two choices. Either a funerary wedding, that it's you know, bland, dull, boring. Like it's like this Sheikh said, what's the difference between the, the funeral, the funerary gathering and the gathering of you know, and, and the wedding? Or in some parts of you know, sub subcontinental culture, there's not self-hate. I, I went to Pak when I was in Pakistan in 2007. I was asked to give a dars at a wedding. And I wasn't officiating the wedding. I said, why? He says, oh, we have a schedule. So then like six I was like number four of six or third of five giving a dars. So I tried to convince them. That, you, know, you know, this is not the time to give durus. Someone's getting married to the time. Of, the Prophet Wasallam said, right? right? That announced the, the, the marriage with, with the duff. And that's the difference between marriage and, and zina. That marriage is done secretly, it is done by celebration. But you do in beautiful, it is actually from the sunnah to celebrate, but celebrate in ways pleasing to Allah. So I opted out of that. I, I, I advised them, that they, they were very keen on having their, their darses. So I latched onto one of my wife's uncle, the mamus. I said, I'm going to be hanging out with, I said, Mamu, I'm off duty. <laughs> I'm off duty. They said, Sheikh Saab, really? I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I do not, I'll, I'll be teaching online during the day. I have my administrative responsibilities. That's my religious duty for the day. So I excuse myself. And I deliberately sat with the people who are not listening to the, the, the dars because, uh, you know, that's not the time for the dars. So I took a bunch of people. We went to the back and we were like trying out their, their various uh, delights. But they were kind of amazed. You're not listening to the dars? No, I didn't come for the dars. I came for, <laughs> for the wedding. Right? So these are things that you know we need. But one of the practical things as well is one of the ways to change bad habits is, you know, for example, there's a gathering. Right? That part of good character is what we are proactive to facilitate the good, and that's also from nasiha. So you know that if the family gathering sort of descends into gossip and so on. Proactively open good topics. But also from the taqwa of feet is that you can move around in the gathering. So if the auntie, sometimes there's people, uncles or aunties, they just won't change the topic. Now you try to encourage them to change, but they won't discreetly. You don't create a havoc, but if they won't, if they won't desist, then you can go. One of the 
ways of taqwa of the feet is do something good instead. Grab a tray of tea and serve tea. Go talk to the young folk. So what's going on? Or ask even if you're not interested. Change the topic. But sometimes they can. Nay, let me tell you about Bilal. He is such a scumbag. I thought there's a word called scrum bag. Because there's an uncle who used to call, use the word scrum bag. But I don't think there's a word like that anymore. So, or you just walk somewhere else where people aren't doing that. Okay. So, from the taqwa feet sometimes is that you take, you know, you take refuge in the, in the washroom. So you're somewhere, and at least right now they're engaging in a topic. You step away for a moment or two, come back. And then you can also feign ignorance. He said, um, folks, What's going on with with the you know with the cricket series, or whatever topic, or who did you know? There's been these, these trades. The, the Raptors seem to have gotten a whole bunch of new players and trades. Like what's going on? And you you might not even be interested, but sometimes part of taqwa feet. Sometimes you have to step away and come back. You come back. You can ask. You know. You kind of you, you're new to the gathering, and but being proactive, you change the topic. Similarly. If family, so we, actually my siblings and I had come up with the plan. Sometimes we had a relative, they'd come and see the family and they'd want to sort of honor the family, honor us by taking us out for lunch, etc. They're old, he's older than my father. So um, sometimes give some pretty shady, like I would never go to a restaurant, especially Muslim restaurant that, that, that serves alcohol, even if it's like got 100 halal certifications or whatever. So... So my, my brother, sister, and myself, we agreed that when you say, let's go for lunch, one of us would make a suggestion. The second would, would sort of second them. And then sometimes we sort of disagree, but we'd come up with something. I said, but what about this? What about that? We, but all the choices would be, uh, the choices that we as a family would all be comfortable with. And ultimately, uncle didn't, wasn't. He said, but that place is very good. Oh, but... but you know, so and so, but you know that place has. You should really check it out. Because there's no merit in arguing deen. And one of the, the Prophet said, "Yes, siru wa asiru." Make things easy for people. Don't make them hard. One of the way you make them hard is to argue about it. So why do you want to go there? It is this, 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 this. this. So just do it. Be a shepherd. Just guide them towards a better choice. Just guide them towards a better choice. So we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for. Sincerity and steadfastness and uprightness. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa Any questions before we close? Go ahead. Wa alaykum salam. Hmm. No, it's not really. Hmm. So, is there a difference between like the the Quran, the Mus'haf only in Arabic or Arabic with translation or the translation only. So the Hanafis are the strictest in it. That the the translation is Quran as well. Because that's translation of the Quran. It contains the primary meaning of the Quran. It doesn't encompass all the meaning. It can, so the, actually the legally stronger position in the Hanafi school is that it's obligatory to have wudu to touch even the translation. But the other, it's a sunnah. But it's, so it's still, it's not just like, so in general, you know, where one can, even with the translation, one, one has wudu. But the, one of the, you know, the, but a, but a smartphone or a tablet, etc., doesn't become a Qur'an. The more precautious position is that one treats it like the Qur'an where, where one can. So, if someone one can't, but these are facilitations. If someone commutes and, but, but you know, by train or something, they want to read the Quran. They, they, you can re recite the Quran even without wudu, but it's sunnah to have wudu. But in those situations, if you're using a you know, like a digital device, the digital device is not a Quran. You can't. In that case, you can You cannot touch the text itself. But also, some you can, you can switch to listening. You can switch listening, and listening has at least as much reward as reciting it. For example, I used to travel a lot on the plane. You're trying to read Quran, then you lose your wudu. Okay, 
So you open the Quran app and start listening to it. Because right now there's turbulence or they're serving the food. It's hard to get to the washroom. So you can listen to it as well. And that also applies to, for example, for your sisters during their period, etc. That you can listen to the Quran. You can read it without reciting it. Reading, like when you read a book, do you actually recite the book? Recitation is an action of the, of the tongue. Do you recite the books you read? No, when we read, right? So, touching and reciting is not permitted during, uh, during a woman's period, but listening to it is permissible. Reading it without reciting it is permissible. Reading the tafsir, and there's many points of connection, interaction, even with the Quran. We can see the related answers on, on seekers, bismillah ta'ala. Tamaman. Will animals intercede on your behalf on the day of judgment? I don't know. But good deeds do. So if you're good to a particular animal, that act of being good to the animal will be an intercession. And we know about you know, the prostitute who goes to heaven because she took care of an animal. The corrupt person who assisted an animal and you know, that was their cause of entering paradise. It's, it's a big deal because animal... Um, Someone, of course, asked that, would, would my pet enter paradise? They actually sent me an urgent message about that. My, said my, my pet cat, Tiger, is about to die. And he was a good citizen of this world. He never heard anything unless he intended to eat it. Will Tiger would be, would be in paradise? Now, my, my ego wanted to say, look, focus on you getting to paradise, and then you won't have any worry. But you have to be diplomatic, and you know. The so, and ultimately in paradise, you know, if one may Allah subhanahu wa taala grant us and you and our parents and loved ones and teachers and yours, that is that lahum ma yasha'una inda rabbihim. They shall have all they wish with their Lord. Waladayna mazid, and with us is that which is incomparably greater. Right? So, so that's you know. Um, so someone wants their pet cat to be with them. Now what you're inspired to seek in paradise, don't worry about it here. But whatever you... And there's no sorrow and regret in paradise. So... so alhamdulillah. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.